As they're doing that, let's begin in the Gospel of John, chapter 7. <coughs> and um, the name of the class is Troubles and Trials, Stumbling Blocks, or Stepping Stones. <coughs> um, and I want to just uh, start in John 7, just looking at one verse where Jesus is speaking here. It's verse uh, 16. <clears throat> John 7, 16. <clears throat> Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. <clears throat> the reason why I'm reading this is because um, this first class, what we're going to do is we're going to just try to look at scriptures <clears throat> um, and um, most of us we if someone asked us they would say you know do you believe the Bible and we'd say yes um, and they'd say do you believe the whole Bible <clears throat> and we would say yes but I fear that we all don't know everything in the Bible yet. <laughs> None of us do. I mean, I've been at this thing for 40 some odd years and I'm barely scratching the surface. <clears throat> and the area we're dealing with, this is uh, based on a workbook or a book that uh, I wrote, yeah, 1988 or something like that, <clears throat> when I was seven. <clears throat> and, uh, but I was little. And, uh, <clears throat> and the Lord had really, really been dealing with me about some things. And um, <clears throat> uh, at that time, let's see, I had already graduated from Bible school, been a missionary, pastored three churches, started a Bible school, not even this one. Um, oh, man, a lot of stuff. <clears throat> And he started dealing with me in this area in, in the scriptures. And I think the, the only real fully powerful way to be dealt with of the Lord is by the Holy Spirit in the scriptures. It's powerful. <clears throat> and at that time, um, I had a different view of certain things. And that view or those doctrines that I had built up over the years um, really basically came from all the teaching that I'd had, okay? From all the different teaching that I'd had. <clears throat> and we assume that all of our teaching, including my teaching, including, you know, we assume that it's all correct and right. <clears throat> and, and that's not to say that it was wrong per se, but you know, there's always an expanded view of the Lord. I mean, Jesus is the ancient of days. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. <clears throat> He's the length and the breadth as Paul describes him. There will be throughout the eternal ages to come learning the riches of Christ. So, so, what makes us think we really got it figured out at this stage? <clears throat> and I don't mean that mean. I just mean if we were just realistic about the thing, we've got a lot to learn. <clears throat> and, and I know, I honestly know um, that I do. I also got something stuck to my boot, and that's never a good thing. see what this is. Caitlin, report to the office. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, my God. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> All right, so the doctrine that I had at a certain juncture was really mine. <clears throat> I had been 
involved with uh, several different churches in several different countries. <clears throat> I had been everything from a teacher in chapel to ministering in churches to prison and everything. <clears throat> and, and in that, hearing a lot of different people speak. And, you know, you hear somebody speak and, and uh, you go, wow, that's really good. And so you, you embrace that doctrine, you know what I mean? You sort of pull it in to your bosom and you say, okay, you know, that's, that's got to be right. <coughs> and maybe some of it's right, you know what I mean? Maybe not all of it's right. Same thing with my teaching, even during this course, you know. Um, I would wish that everything I shared was exactly perfect in every way, <clears throat> but it couldn't possibly be. It's your job to search the scriptures to find out what I'm sharing is true or not. Okay. And you should do that with anybody and everybody. <clears throat> um, why? Because you doubt and fear everybody? No, because you want to know the truth, and the best way to know it is from the word. <clears throat> All right, so at, the, at a certain juncture, I had gathered, it's kind of like I had several baskets on me, and I'd gathered a lot of different doctrines, and they were my doctrines. And, <clears throat> and, and at a point in time, God began to intervene with the scriptures and with the movement of the Holy Spirit to begin to open my horizons <clears throat> more to the Lord and more to his doctrine. And that's what he says right here. My, this is Jesus talking. My doctrine is not my own. It's not mine, but him that sent me. All right. <clears throat> um, and it is where your heart begins to lay hold of the Lord, not just your mind laying hold of somebody's teaching. Okay. <clears throat> and um, you've heard me say it over and over, never to just believe what I share, but to search it out in the word of God. And I mean that with all my heart. <clears throat> so, um, what I want to do is just begin with, with some, some basic scriptures, uh, and we'll not get into the book probably this first session. And <clears throat> I, wanna, I want you to do me a favor during this first session, if you will, and that is, I want you to see <clears throat> if the doctrine that you hold lines up with, uh, what, I, what I got, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about seven or eight scriptures. Is, which uh, seven or eight scriptures is a good amount to say, hey, maybe there's something to this. You know what I mean? I mean, a lot of people pull one scripture out and go, look. <clears throat> but... Um, to truly, you know, just be open with the Lord. You don't have to be open with me or this class. Just be open with the Lord and say, is this, do I, does my mentality, does the thing, does the doctrines I picked up in my basket line up with the word of God? <clears throat> and if it does, great. And if it doesn't, don't go into <laughs> condemnation or all that kind of stuff. Just say, Lord, teach me your doctrine so that my doctrine is not my own, it's yours. That's, that's the thing. All right. <clears throat> so let's begin with uh, Philippians. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3. And this one was one of the ones that really, really challenged me. <clears throat> um, and I think the reason why I was so challenged was because of the sincerity, the sincerity of Paul's pursuit of the Lord. I'd, I'd, I'd read in the book of Acts what he'd been through. <clears throat> I'd read in his different letters his stand, and I came to believe that God chose Paul to write most of the New Testament for a reason. And that reason was he was determined to know the Lord, not just know teachings. I mean, I want Jesus, you know. And I, I, I don't need more junk shoved in my head. 
I want my heart opened. And I want the Holy Spirit to have a, it's like a straight shot, you know, with the veil rent where the Holy of Holies can come and fill up my compartment also. <clears throat> and so um, let's start in, this is Philippians 3, and let's start at verse 7. All right, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. <clears throat> all right, right there. I mean, you don't, we're not even getting very far. Maybe we won't cover all these scriptures. <laughs> but does that line up with, with the way we think? You know, <clears throat> when I first got saved, the things that I counted lost for Christ were all the bad things I did. They weren't the things that, I counted as gain. They were things I counted bad. <clears throat> you know, okay, well, I'm going to give up cussing and I'm going to give up, you know, being stoned and, you know, doing drugs and, you know, all the things that I did and <clears throat> all the wildness, you know, and, um, and, and I'm going to, you know, and the, the picture I, I'll never forget was me sort of going into the throne room, to the throne of grace carrying in my arms uh, a, little, a little sack of filthy words and my cigarettes and, and all my drugs and my, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, and just coming before Jesus and laying them at his feet and saying, here, Jesus. And he's, he's kind of looking going, you know, I, I really don't smoke. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Something like that. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I really don't want this stuff in here. You know what I mean? <laughs> But I mean, <clears throat> but in my little sincere mind, and you know, you can be sincerely wrong, you know, in my little sincere mind, I thought I was really doing something big until I read Paul. He says, I'm giving him the things that I think are gain to me. <clears throat> and if you'll just check the scriptures in front of this, the things that he's counting as gain are his religious things. That blew me away now. You know, I mean, that really got to me because he was talking about, you know, all of the things that he prides himself in, that he was a circumcised the eighth day and that he's uh, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew, and was touching the law. He was a Pharisee. All of the things <clears throat> that make you religiously um, have a good reputation, he just wanted Christ. And he really did. And he was getting rid of the good stuff, the God stuff, but not, it was for God, not God, if I can say it like that, you know. <clears throat> well, that just, that just started deeply affecting me because I saw here a man that God was using to try to instruct me that, that my viewpoint is wrong from the very beginning it was wrong of just giving up bad stuff and then you know just real quick you know of course in the in the garden of eden the failure there was that they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil it was a tree that included good and evil together and he said don't eat of that tree you know we always think there was two trees there, a tree of good and a tree of evil that's not what the Bible says. That the good and evil were on one tree and the other was a tree of life. Life, that's what we need. We need life. We need the life of Christ. We need him. And we need him not just in heaven standing there for us, praying over us and keeping us from sinning. You know, there came a day when I didn't, I didn't want to just be kept from sin anymore. You know, I just spent so many years fighting sin. You know, and it was like, it's like going into an arena with all these different beasts, and I'm in there, and, you know, I'm like a gladiator, you know, and I'm going to wrestle them to the ground. You know, oh, today I'm taking you on. And, you know, and, and, and then as soon as I've got one to the ground, I think I'm going to deal with him. Two more jump on me, you know. <clears throat> and then go back that night. And, <sighs> okay. And then get up the next morning and go back into the arena and, you know, wrestling with something else. <clears throat> and never getting a chance to pursue the Lord. 
too busy fighting what was wrong instead of finding him in a greater way. And of course, if you don't find him in a greater way, you're not going to defeat those guys because he's already defeated them at Calvary. And so I, I realized <clears throat> that the devil was playing me. You know what that means when somebody's playing you? <laughs> the devil was playing me. He was keeping me busy with what's wrong instead of pursuing what's right, which is not good, but Christ, the tree of life. And the Lord said, you may freely eat of every tree, the tree of life. You can freely eat of that, but stay away from this thing of good and evil. <clears throat> and so Paul figures that out, and he realizes the sin issue has been dealt with by the blood. Every time you sin, Jesus doesn't have to get up from the throne, go over, find Calvary, get back on a cross, die again, and, and we go, I'm sorry, I keep doing this to you. In truth, you don't keep doing that to him. He's already died and rose again victorious over that. But the, but the victory over, and let's just identify the, the difference between the tree and the fruit, the root and the fruit. A tree can be a bad tree and it brings forth bad fruit that is, that could hurt or make someone sick or be poison, literally make somebody die. The fruit would. And pulling all the fruit off of that tree is not going to change anything because it will eventually grow more fruit. Most Christians don't realize that if it's not Christ, then it's us and we're the bad root. And that, you know, people are shocked, you know. They go, you know, I have people come to me all the time, really, and go, I, I just, I have to tell you, I did something wrong, and I did this, and I sinned, and, you know, I can't believe I did it. And I have to say, well, I can. <laughs> well, I'm not shocked if it's not Christ. Guess what? You, it's you. Oh, God, help us. <laughs> you know? We need Jesus, not just up there to go, you know, oh, I forgive you, abhi gabi, no skoda magoda, or whatever he says, you know. You know, and then go, okay, you're forgiven just to go back out, you know. And, you know, the old saying in Texas is this, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. Well, it looks nice, I guess. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and you can go buy the most expensive French perfume and spray it down and put a beautiful uh, diamond necklace on it. And it, you know, and put a nice little leash, you know, and just walk along and everybody go, oh, that's a fine looking pig you got there. You know, that's way better than mine. But then you get close to a hog wallet and that thing's going to break loose from your little fixed thing that's trying to keep it in line and go, you know, jump in the middle of the, Don't get mad, but I'm talking about you <laughs> and, and me and me, you know, <clears throat> and we go, well, what, what is wrong with my pig? <laughs> Nothing. It's, do, it's doing exactly what they all do. All of your little works to improve it won't improve it. God didn't, Jesus didn't come down here to die, say, I forgive you. Now do good and disappear. Every one of us who received Jesus asked him in. Our hope is Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ in heaven. Not even Christ in our midst. Is he in, seated at the right hand of the Father? Yes. Is he in our midst of two or more gathered here? Yes. Is either one of those our hope of glory? No. Christ in you, Colossians 1.27 says, is, your, is the hope, God's hope. And yours hope and my hope. And so Paul has realized some deep things. Th these aren't teachings to him. 
Amen? This isn't teaching to him. He's going, look, whatever is gained to me, whatever promotes me, I don't want it. And let's see what he does want. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, is the King James, that I may win Christ. You, do you know what the translation of that word dung is? Oh, you do? Okay. A lighter version would be poo-poo. Okay. And that's a, li that's a lighter version, okay? He, he's, you know, I mean, it's, you know, my kids, sometimes they call it number two. And I've often said, you know, Jesus is number one and I'm number two. <laughs> you know? That's what it says, isn't it? You know, I know you won't hear that in your average church, but that's what Paul said. It's in your Bible. It's in your Bible. That's the key. You know, it doesn't matter how crude I am. The point is, is it in the Word of God? And it is in the Word of God. <clears throat> All right? But then, then he's talking about getting rid of everything else and looks at all of the things that were gained to him, all of the things that could promote him in the eyes of the religious crowd, that would make him look more spiritual, that would make him appear something really of God. All of those things, he gathers them up in a pile and says, when I look at this, it looks like poo-poo. Okay? Okay? All right. Now, back to our original thing that we started. How many of us hold this view? How many of us genuinely hold this view? Or how many of us are still pursuing some sort of a, you know, it's like a, it's like a religious ladder that you're trying to climb to the top. Well, how about just the Tower of Babel? Building to God, and he has to deal with it and put it away. <clears throat> well, that's in one form, that's what we're doing. But you look at Jacob. Jacob, when he saw the Lord, he saw what, what we term Jacob's ladder. It really wasn't Jacob's ladder at all, was it? He just saw it. It happened to be there when he laid his head on that rock and he, asked, he saw a ladder and he saw the Son of Man as, the, as if he were that ladder and the angels of God ascending and descending on that. And, it, and there was this contact between heaven and earth, which is Christ crucified, and it is... It is the way in, but first into, into Christ, and oneness with Christ, so that it's not I, but Christ, okay? And, you know, in my earlier days when I would be, because I was, you know, I mean, I, when I was in Bible school, I had got voted as president of the student council, and you know, I led the chapel and all kind of stuff, you know. And, and it, it really made me feel good. You know, the, the, the rest of the students voted me in as president. But in those early days is when I began to see Christ crucified. And when I say see, start seeing. I'm still seeing, and I still need to see, so let's make that clear, and still want to see. <laughs> but I would ask myself, okay, this feeling you're having right now, is this Jesus, or is this you? <laughs> you know? Oh, man, more times than not, I have to go, oh, oh, boy, let's not do this game anymore, Lord, okay? And the Holy Spirit go, no, let's do this the rest of our life. And he would do it on this basis. He, he, he said, you know, do you want Jesus? Yes, Lord. Well, this is the way to get him. Do you want Jesus? <gasps> yeah, yeah, yes, Lord. You know. <clears throat> because it hurt my widow feelings. 
that I couldn't have all those things that satisfied my flesh, you know. And I'm sure this has happened with you, but there were things <clears throat> that I wanted and the Lord wasn't giving me, and I just kept praying, you know, and there were things my soul, my flesh wanted, you know. And, oh, Lord, give me this, give me that. And, and then finally, you know, maybe after years, he would finally break through and deal with me, and I, I didn't care about that anymore, and then he'd give it to me. <laughs> You're just going, well, it's no fun now. <laughs> I mean, there's no, you know, there's no... It's almost like this, this uh, gluttonous person inside of me that's just eating your favorite ice cream or something, you know, and you get it and you go, <laughs> you know, outwardly, you know, oh, hallelujah, I'm spiritual. But inside it's going, I just eat this, <laughs> more. <laughs> Don't be looking at me spiritual. You know what's on the inside of you too. <clears throat> but I... But I, on different things, I would get to the point, you know, the scripture said, I think it was David who said, my, my soul is like a weaned child. Oh, yeah. No longer the milk of the word, but the, the meat. And no longer just something that feeds me that I, oh, oh I just want to have this because it feels good. I want the Lord. I want the Lord. I don't want me. And, and I had enough of me coming forth <clears throat> in ugly ways that really, really showed me. And, you know, you can read, you know, all of sin and come short of the glory. You can read that the, we all in Adam, you know, are corrupt in the old nature. We're all corrupt. But when you see that old nature is you and you see it regularly and you see it fighting, literally trying to take the glory out of Jesus's hands, you know, and his nail scarred hands, he goes, OK, I take it. That's even worse. No, don't tell me to take it. Let's at least fight over it. And then you win. You're God. You know what I mean? <clears throat> when I went over Jesus, I don't feel good. You know, <clears throat> all right, so he, he counts it dung because he wants to gain Christ. Oh, glorious heart for the Lord. I mean, it's one thing to give up this, give up that. It's one thing to <clears throat> go to the mission field, be a missionary and help people. It's one thing, but it's another thing to come face to face with your own self your own selfie self and have to say no because he's used to getting his way and that's when trouble begins until the cross is settled and, and it's no longer no it's you're dead and Christ is the life of this vessel when that starts happening, whoo, you start talking about genuine, real victory, no longer doctrinal victory, you know, and I don't want doctrinal victory. Sometimes you have to learn doctrine first, and then the Holy Spirit, you know, bring that forth as life, so I don't, I'm not putting it down in that sense, but I do put it down if we think that just getting the doctrine of it's going to change anything, because it, you know, the doctrine of Christ never changed anything, only Christ changes something. <clears throat> All right, so he goes on to say in verse 9, uh, now he changes. It's no longer about what he's counting loss to win Christ, but, but what he wants to gain and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. Okay, and this is a, we won't go long on this, but well, we are in Christ and he has made unto us righteousness. And that's not based on how good you did today or how good you didn't do. That's your foundation. You can't live there. Everything can't come from there, but you have to have a foundation to build on so that you don't sink every time you mess up. We all fail. We all sin. Everybody messes up, and there is a... It's like a tightrope walker in a net down there. The net is we're in Christ. And if you fall, you're caught, okay? <clears throat> 
but he didn't leave it there. Uh, Be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. <clears throat> now, verse 10, here we are. Paul has been in the ministry for a lot of years. He's writing this letter to the Philippians. He'd already been to Philippi before. Um, he'd been to many other places. I don't know at what point. You know, he had three um, missionary journeys <clears throat> uh, throughout the world. Um, but he's been with the Lord. He's not a newbie, okay? He's not a novice. He's been with the Lord, and he's got a prayer here. Uh, he's got a yearning for Jesus. He says, that I may know him. All right, you know, I can see one of the brethren standing there with him and going, well, Brother Paul, you know him. You're saved. It's okay. Come on, buck up. You know, smile. Come on, give me a smile. Come on. Come on, you know, it's going to be all right. You know, it's okay. And Paul's saying, no, it's not okay. I want to know the Lord more. Someone might even say to Paul, you know the Lord more than all of us. What are you talking about? And he would go, I don't, I don't deal in quantity of information. I deal in heart hunger that says I want to know Jesus I don't even think in terms of quantity I think in terms of my heart still yearns for Jesus and that's all I know and I want to know him I want to know him I don't want more religion I don't want I can just here, I don't want all the things that you, you know. Well, Paul, sit in on my Sunday school class and you, you know. <clears throat> I want Jesus. And you, and, you know, it's the best thing. Keep your heart pure. Meaning what? Without sin? No. Keep your heart pure. What does it mean? With, uh, never fail again? No. Keep your heart pure in that there's only one thing that you want, and that's Jesus. And you want the Lord, and you're sincere. And if nobody else at that moment wants the Lord, you still want the Lord. You keep your heart pure. Why? Why would you keep it pure? Meaning, you know, I mean, it's like this oil down here. This is uh, virgin pure um, olive oil. Nothing else mixed in. Nothing else mixed in. It's pure in that way. Okay, now let's <coughs> apply that. Pure. We, we always go off into such things. The pure in heart shall see God. Your heart is pure in that you want to see God. That's your heart. And, and you know, Folks, I'm, you know, I'm just going to say this. You can fail. You can mess up. You can do all sorts of stuff and still keep your heart pure. Did you know that? To, to see God. I know, I, and I've told this, I can't even tell you the number over the years <clears throat> where I would talk to some young person or some person that's, you know, midway in their walk with the Lord and, and tell them, because uh, I'm leaving, I'm leaving the mission field and won't be back, or I'm leaving this area, of, and I just say, look, whatever you do, no matter what you do after this day forth, whatever failures you do, none of those demand that you give up the Lord. None of them. Now, that's not the way it's taught in a lot of places, folks. They say, well, you've sinned, you're separated from God. You know, okay, so what does that mean? In most people's mind, that means, well, if I've sinned and I'm separated from God, then I, I can't go to God. But he's the only one you can go to. And he'll receive you. You know? He'll receive you. Why? Because he's already received you. We're talking about something you did wrong. You're still in the family. You know, and you have to, you have to see this stuff. 
You do. You have to see this stuff. You're in the family. You're one with Christ. It's like, it's like Jesus is the true vine and you're a branch. And so you, you as a branch, you sin. So God the Father comes on with a machete and goes, that's it. We had a whack and cuts Jesus' branch off. Is that what happens? I almost said H-E double hockey sticks. No. He does not reject himself. And you say, well, that's not, this isn't him. No, no, what you did didn't come from him. But you are one with him. And the one person that you should run to every time. And no matter what the failure, never let your heart believe that you are separated from God. I'm just telling you. You don't have to believe me. You can take the other route, but you'd be a lot happier this way. And you'll find that it's true when you come back. Didn't the prodigal son find that? Man, when he got back, he goes, I'm sorry, I sinned. The father then shut up. Here, take the ring, take the robe, take the da-da-da-da, and treated him like a king. And he's going, you know, this is weird, but I'm going to go with it. You know what I mean? Because this is my father, and, you know, this is his house. And, you know, if I was really stinky like I think I am, he wouldn't have, you know, the first thing he'd have done and the first thing many pastors would do is, you failed, that's it, get out, you know. Some people with their own kids, you failed, that's it. I don't love you anymore. <clears throat> God's love will never change, and I don't think our love should ever change. No matter what, and we can still love. You say, well, I don't love what they do. Well, do you love, do you love them? Do you love them? Well, I can't see them. All I see is what they do. Well, there's your problem. There's your problem. <clears throat> All right. Well, we're moving right along, aren't we? <laughs> woo I feel like we're, Yeah. Like we're at Texas Motor Speedway. Uh, be found in, let's see, all the way down to verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Okay, we got three things listed. I don't think they're separate. I think the three are one. But nonetheless, <clears throat> here's how he wants to know Jesus. <clears throat> the power of his resurrection. <clears throat> Let's just clarify real quick. That doesn't say I want to know resurrection power. It says I want to know him in the power of his. Now, you see the difference? Because some people are going, what you need is resurrection power. No, what you need is the power of his resurrection. It is his resurrection. You're looking for resurrection power on you, so you'll be jumping around. I'm, you know. I'm already in heaven. I'm only, you know, a few feet off the ground, but I'm, I'm there, you know. No, you're not. You're, you're seated in Christ, and everything now comes from union with Christ. If it's death, if it's resurrection, it's all his, and you are a member of his body. Isn't that okay? I like that. I'm okay with that. <clears throat> all right. So, having... Um, uh, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, there's, there's one right there. When I read this for the first time, not the first time the ink on white paper, but read it and saw what it was saying, I remember this thought. Hmm, now there's something I've never asked for before. Yeah, I'm just being honest. I went, man, I have never wanted to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. <clears throat> Not only that, but I can't remember a single sermon from anybody in the Bible school or taught in the Bible school where I was at or any of the churches I went to before I was pastoring that they anybody even mentioned such a thing. In fact, it seemed that everybody mentioned avoid suffering. Avoid and 
that shouldn't be a hard teaching since our old nature automatically goes, ah, I don't want to suffer, or I don't want, I'm uncomfortable, you know, I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we all naturally, you know, I mean, I've often said, I remember the Lord said it to me when I was in Bible school. I was, I was uh, one of about five, six, seven, eight hippies that went into this Bible school and everybody else was assembly of God and they all wore suits and I had really long hair and I wore you know knee-high moccasins and see-through puffy shirts and stuff like that <clears throat> um, and I was awesome <laughs> <laughs> just joking now you're embarrassing me girlfriend um, but you know, was completely different than all of the Bible school students. And everything as a hippie that I wanted to be was to be completely different from society and the man and all of this, you know. And um, so I get into Bible school and I'm going, oh, I'm, I'm different. And the Lord said, you're not different. And I said, oh, well, I'm different. <laughs> <laughs> He said, no, you're not. You're just like everybody else. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to have enough. Everybody wants to be comfortable. Everybody wants He started listing off all this stuff. I went, oh, we all are just like that. You know, it's just a few, out, you know, little outward things. And that's not me. That's what I'm putting on or doing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it hit me. Oh, my God, we're all the same. And my reaction to wanting to know him and the fellowship of his sufferings was probably just like every other Christian, and that was, hmm, I think I'll skip that one and move on to all the promises of God, you know what I mean? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you can live, you can say, I believe all of the Bible, you know, and skip parts, and then forget that you skipped those parts. Because it was like, it was like, you know, walking up on and going, oh, I didn't say that, you know. <laughs> And looking, looking for the things that make you happy. The Lord also gave me another picture of this big smorgasbord, all of this food on these big tables and everything. And, he, and that, those tables represented the word of God and all that was in the word of God. And the Lord said, you know, go eat, go eat. And so I took me a little... You know, I took me a plate, and I went, and I was like, no. And then I said, oh, yeah, oh, I like this. And, you know, no, I don't think I'll, and da-da-da-da, you know, broccoli, I don't know, I don't think so, you know. And, and when I looked around, everybody's plate was filled with something different. I mean, there was some crossover, but everybody had chosen what they liked. And the Lord said, the Bible is not a smorgasbord where you can just pick and choose what you want. Dig in to what's in my heart, and, and I'll change you. And I'll, and I'll also explain, because that's, some of these things are not always easy to explain. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> Our natural human reaction that goes, oh, I don't want that. We have to just say, well, I, I may not be able to fix that immediate reaction, but I can come back and say, you know, Lord, open my eyes beyond my fleshly reaction. I guess that's the best, best way to put it. I just, I remember <clears throat> I traveled with this, this international group of, in, in music and we were singing and doing music and stuff all over the world. And, and um, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, we came into Dallas. Of course, I grew up in Oak Cliff. And, <clears throat> and uh, um, we, uh, we did a show at the Fairmont Hotel in downtown Dallas. And it's still one of the most expensive, best restaurants in Dallas. <clears throat> and uh, um, after the show, they, they brought us in to their dining room and their chefs I mean chef I'd never I grew up in Oak Cliff I don't know if you know Oak Cliff but you, you, you know there ain't no chefs in Oak Cliff okay <laughs> maybe a hot dog stand on the corner but there ain't no chef <clears throat> and um, uh, and we sat down and 
we're all eating food, and it, it was a big thing. And, and this this one guy is eating some asparagus, you know. And the only asparagus I'd ever had was, you know, you go in the frozen food department, and your parents buy it, and it's stringy, and a lot of times it's kind of slimy, and you know, it's like, you know, I had it once, and that was it. You know what I mean? It's like. I'm sorry, but it's like eating your own snot or something, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so this guy goes, <laughs> so this guy goes, oh my God, you've got to eat this asparagus, you know. And I'm, I was, uh, I was in the lead group. There was, there was a couple. In fact, that group was probably around 60 of us. And uh, there was four of us in the lead group, and I played lead guitar and sang harmony. So everybody kind of looked at me and the other guys. So they're all going, "Oh, Randy, you got to try this stuff." I'm going, all the, you know, I mean, the rest of it was just incredible. You know what I mean? I mean, their pies were like, "Oh my God," you know. <laughs> and so he, somebody else gets it. He, he talks someone else into it, and they come back and eat, and they go, "Oh my God." And I'm going, you guys are just putting me on. You're trying to get me to eat this crap. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to do it. And pretty soon somebody else does it. And then it was somebody that I knew to, you know, their taste ran along my line. And they went, Randy, I'm telling you, just try a little bit. So they said, look, I'll get it for you. They grabbed my plate, went up there, put a little on there. And I okay, you know. Everybody's looking at me. I'm going, I feel like an idiot because this is going to taste horrible. Oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. It was incredible. Okay. That, even though I wasn't a Christian at that time, that did something to me. It said, you know, in the right setting, something that I hated was actually good. And, and that when I came to the Lord and remembered that story, I thought, you know, some of my reactions, I'd go, Ooh, and then I'd go, wait a minute, this might be asparagus. I mean, that's how, I, you know, that was how I sort of would work my way through and go. And then I'd say, Lord, <clears throat> you know, help me to comprehend this in the right spirit instead of my negative reactions. Okay. Well, we all can learn from that, amen? I mean, there are things that we don't understand. We don't know everything yet. We ha we're going to have negative reactions. I mean, I've sat in Bible school and went, well, that ain't true, only to find out it was, you know. I, mean, I, res I almost resisted everything that they said, only to, thank God, I would always go back, get in the Word, and I would always go back and ask the Lord to show me if that's true, and so many times he would. And when he showed it to me, it wasn't like, it wasn't like him, he's standing here and I'm standing here and he's going, and it's really bad asparagus. And he's going, go ahead and eat it. You'll like it. Or go ahead and eat it. It's good for you, even though it'll make you choke and want to vomit. It wasn't like that at all. It was like he opened something in me. I'm talking spiritually now to the truth of the word. He opened something in me where my angle changed, where I could see it for what it was and go, oh, well, yeah, what is wrong with me? I almost rejected something that was so important, a very important piece to this puzzle, you know? And, <clears throat> and then I have to maintain that, you know what I mean? It can't be an experience over one thing. I, I have to make it a principle in my life. I will not just reject things that don't sound right to me. And, you know, you know this, but... But there are people who share exactly what we share, but they use different terminology. Terminology, just, just different words. And we listen to them and go, well, that ain't right. Who ever heard of the gloob glob, you know, cycle? <laughs> we go, that's weird, you know. But if we would just shut up, stop judging, and just say, Lord, is, and I had that happen. At a place where they were teaching something, it just sounded weird. And I said, okay, Lord, I just want to get you out of this. And he showed me they're saying the exact same thing we were. They were just using different terminology and different kind of charts and stuff like that. And I went, Lord, what is wrong with me? You know, I mean, because there's that, that you know, folks, we have this judgmental critical thing, you know. And it's almost like we're looking for what's wrong instead of looking for Jesus. And guess what? If you look for what's wrong, you'll find something wrong. 
guess what? If you do that with other people, you'll build it into your being that you judge and criticize. And then when nobody's around you because you've driven them all off with your criticalness, it'll turn on you. <laughs> it will. You've, you've petted it, you've fed it, and you're like, ah, give me more. There's somebody over there. Ah, it's wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, you know, it eats up everybody or chases them all, bites them, and they run off. And they go, well, who are we going to go after now? He goes, you. <laughs> you know. I guess we need to. <laughs> guess we need to quit, don't we? All right, let's take a break. We'll 